Good evening, everyone. This is Jim Crescitelli with the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. Tonight, we're going to talk a little about Lake Apopka. So um, welcome to all of you natives and newcomers who are tuning in for this Facebook Live event, Zoomed from Two Houses. My special guest tonight is Joe Dunn, who is the immediate past president of FOLA, AKA Friends of Lake Apopka, the advocacy group that takes care of the um, lakes hereabouts, let's say. We'll be hearing a lot about FOLA from Joe as we go along. And tonight we're gonna um, show you a history of Lake Apopka and then um, just talk about uh, the present situation as well as what we hope for the future. And Joe's gonna help us with that. So if anyone has any questions, you've got a chat, uh, you've got um, the ability to ask and um, we'll try to catch all those and, and help you out. So thank you again for tuning in very much. So uh, I guess we can start the little um, PowerPoint. Let's see. So Joe, do you have anything to say to the audience before we go forward? No, I'm just grateful for your inviting me, Jim. You know how much I love to talk about Lake Apopka. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I can't think of anyone more qualified. Joe is basically writing a, a book on the history of Lake Apopka, and uh, we're working with him with uh, the sharing of the Friends of Lake Apopka collection that has been left to us by Jim Thomas and that organization. We have it under careful storage at the Winter Garden Heritage Foundation. That's also open to the public for those who want to do detailed research. So thank you, Joe. I appreciate you being here. Let's start with a little background. And that's what we're calling this, past, present, future. Let's see if I can go forward. Okay. I always like to think of Lake Apopka, which at one point was the third largest lake in Florida, as a battery supporting the life of all the peoples living around its shores. That, of course, goes back to the Timucua um, from the uh, from just a couple of thousand years ago to Native Americans who followed in their wake, Seminoles, we call them, to um, settlers who then came later. Joe, um, people still find artifacts around the lake from civilizations before us, don't they? Uh, there have been uh, discoveries of different things, um, but it's been, it hasn't been recent. Um, they, when they dug up the North Shore and drained the North Shore and uh, Hull Island development. So yeah. every now and again, something will pop up, but real archeological um, finds are difficult to come by because everything's been disturbed in the last 50 years. There's been a lot of digging, yeah. We have quite a collection from a couple of different people um, at the Heritage Museum of arrowheads and pot shards. That was definitely a place of high activity around that lake. And when settlers started arriving here in the mid 19th century, they were, um, we're talking about the South Shore from our experience. They were growing produce and eventually citrus and then shipping it all across the lake to the north shore, northeast shore of the lake, where eventually farms were put in. And then things were loaded onto wagons and dragged overland up to Sanford and then put on trains. There were no trains down here until the end of the 19th century. So uh, there was a good chance that your product was going to be a little bit rotten by the time it got to Sanford on the overland trail. And that was remedied they uh there the others there's a map of the overland connections i find these old maps extremely fascinating we have a lot of them at the foundation so those red lines that you see that's your product being dragged overland after it was floated across the lake on barges or steamships up to lake monroe sanford where the railroad lines were and typical shots of farmers. We have a huge agricultural collection we have a lot of photos of the people who actually worked around the lake and in the small towns. There was a scheme um, towards the end of the 19th century to build a, to dig a canal from Lake Apopka, this area here. It eventually became the Beauclair. It headed up to the, uh, yeah, the Mount Dora chain, I think they call it, the Dora chain of lakes. And eventually steamships would then be able to uh, go up to the St. John's River to deliver product. 
not perfect, but better than dragging it overland up to Sanford. So we're talking now about the 1860s, 1870s. And there's an overhead of the Beauclair Canal as it um, stands today. Have you been up there? Have you been up to that area? Uh, yeah, that's a great kayaking spot, by the way. Yeah, can you go up but actually through, through the canal? You can put in at McDonald Ramp, um, which is a beautiful a boat ramp that Lake County and the St. John's River Water Management District put in, and it's very calm. Whereas if you kayak out in the middle of uh, Lake Apopka, you can get some incredibly strong winds that makes it difficult, but it's a very protected um, paddle and you can go north up to Beauclair through the lock. The lock is always manned and open during daylight hours, or you can turn south and go down to Lake Apopka it's great birding, it's great kayaking, it's a, a and mm -hmm. well, I'm not an angler, but I understand it's great fishing as well. Yeah, people are starting to catch, they're starting to catch again. Yeah, that's true. Uh, when the trains arrive, we have two lines. Anyone familiar with Winter Garden and the south shore of Lake Apopka by 1899, we had two railroad lines that basically precluded the need for a canal because the rail lines now connected to Sanford in St. Petersburg, we could get our produce out anywhere in the country just because of our two rail lines. And for those who are not familiar with it, some of our watchers, um, the Orange Belt, eventually the ACL, ran along Plant Street where the West Orange Trail is. So you're following the old railroad bed as you ride the bike trail. And then the back street, what we call Joiner Street, there was a second line that came from Tavares to Okoe, and both of them were busy 24-7 for almost a century shipping produce and oranges. So the arrival of rail basically changed this area incredibly, really started to attract settlers. And another um, way that the lake became well known across the country, we started uh, promoting Florida as a, a, a tourism paradise, the 1910s, the 1920s. So postcards like this were sent up, hence drew a lot of what they called tin can tourists who came to Florida in their tin lizzies and ate out of tin cans on the side of the road. I don't know if they found any evidence of that around the lake, but they can keep digging. You never know. So Florida is becoming a paradise drawn. Central Florida is becoming a sportsman's and tourist paradise, basically because of beautiful, cold, clear, clean Lake Apopka. It was in its glory. People are discovering the beauties of that lake and all the land around it. Um, tourist camps start to pop up around the edges of the lake. And these are some of the places on uh, in Montverde and Lake Apopka. At one point, what is it? Two dozen fishing camps were set up around Lake Apopka, I think? There were 29 at one point, 29, 29 fish camps. And they were all busy. They were all busy. Yes, they were. Yeah. Uh, they built hotels specifically for anglers. I know you've heard of the Edgewater being built for fishermen. It opened in 1927. And the Oakland Hotel, also known as the Angebilt, a lot of people don't realize that this rather large hotel stood on Tub Street, North Tub Street, just a few blocks from Lake Apopka in Oakland. And that was built also for anglers to fish off of the, well, to launch off of the Oakland dock. So it was a pretty big deal. At the, this point, it was basically being used for, you know, for fishing. We were the largemouth bass capital of the world after a while. Uh, there's Trailer City on a postcard from the 1930s built on the south shore of Lake Apopka, a WPA project under Mayor George Walker. This drew even more people who then came to town and spent money on Plant Street and all the shops. So helped us get through the depression. And those are basically the glory days. Uh, it was a fisherman's paradise. People were attracted to it from all over the world. Large hotels are built. And then things start to change. And that's how we talk about the, uh, well, recent past. <laughs> when they built that canal, um, I think we put a little note on here saying that it lowered the, the, it lowered the level of the lake by what, about three feet? It did, yeah. Yes, because what happened then is you, you allowed the flow north into the Harris chain of lakes, Dora, Carlton, Eustis, Griffin, Harris, 
And when that water spread out over that wide geography, it lowered the lake three feet, which exposed the North Shore. It was still part of the lake, but it was more marshy than the lower right. part of the lake. Which So in 1893, when that happened, they set the stage for 1941. Right. When they wanted to actually turn it into um, farmland. Right. Um, I know they drained a lot of that. We have some really cool blueprints at the foundation that, um, that show miles and miles worth of soundings where they're seeing how deep the marsh goes. So they know how deep to go for drainage. It's pretty incredible. I mean, this is 1941. That was a huge engineering job. I think what, 21,000 acres? Yes. Something like that, right? Yeah. So uh, the lake is being impacted, like you say, 1941 with the planting of farms on the North Shore, planting for produce, vegetables for the war effort. And then um, insidiously, and you know, who, who was really thinking of it in those days? It wasn't in our consciousness. They had um, sewer plants on the South Shore, a citrus processing plants and a chemical fertilizer factory over on the West. So all of these things are tossing effluent into the lake, which is so big, it's not apparent at first kind of snuck up on us. That's how I think of it. Is that a good way of thinking of it, that it kind of That's, snuck up on us? And yeah, that and what you just said, we didn't have the perspective that we have now looking backwards of what was harmful. People thought, yeah, that's a lot of water out there. There's billions of gallons of water. What's the big deal? So yeah. people didn't think about it the same way we think about it today. Right, right. 2020 hindsight, like we say. Um, I'm not sure of the date of this picture. People tell me it's like the late 60s, early 70s. Basically, the lake is suffocated at this point, at this point because the, um, I always kind of get confused about this. The fertilizer runoff caused the algae bloom to really bloom and cover the surface of the lake. Is that what? That's exactly the, the, the nutrients got into the water and fed the algae, the algal bloom, blocked out the sunlight killed all the plant life and the algae just took over. And followed by the fish too, because they have nothing exactly. to eat and breathe in, yeah. Yeah, the fish need the aquatic vegetation to and, o yeah. and oxygen and sunlight to subsist. So yeah, it was, it was really disastrous. Yeah, on a personal note, when I moved down here in 78, uh, you know, I'd ask people, Lake Apopka, you know, third large, fourth largest lake in the state. What's it all about? Is it a recreation area? What do you do there? They were like, no, we, yeah, no one really pays attention to the lake because it's kind of, kind of polluted, people would say. <laughs> and then, you know, the story grows. That's a typical um, photo of a fish camp that just shut down. There was lots of that ringed around, you know, ringing, ringing the lake. There was no fishing industry, no sports fishing industry anymore. And the North Shore basically became planted, just like you see there. Things stretched to the horizon. And um, like I say, not just the farms, a lot of things were contributing to the pollution of the water. These farms were huge. And um, there's also the environmental impact on people who worked in the fields by, you know, the spraying of insecticides. So there are a lot of issues that came about. And um, it's a good, people woke up, people, people began to advocate. Um, you've had, you know, you had tens of thousands of people living around a lake that was basically not being used for what it could be. Like I say, that battery that fueled civilizations that lived around it, it's like that was a dead battery now. And there's my hero. You can tell me about this guy. That's my hero. Jim Thomas founded uh, Friends of Lake Apopka in 1991 and they worked several years to try to get the North Shore farms to self-police. Some could and some wouldn't. Some couldn't and some wouldn't. If you had a small farm it was hard to set aside a big part of your acreage in order to do retention ponds etc. So finally in 1996 uh, Jim convinced the state legislature to purchase all of the farms and by 1998, the, uh, the farms were purchased. St. John's River Water Management District was given the task of restoring it to a uh, wetlands. And that was absolutely the single most pivotal point in the recovery of Lake Apopka 
and uh, Jim Thomas was the driver behind that. Yeah, he's an incredible guy. The energy mm -hmm. towards that lake, the love for that lake. I mean, you go any place, anything to do with Lake Apopka, that's the name that springs right to mind. He's Oak an Nature guy. Preserve has the Jim Thomas Environmental Education Center, as a matter of fact. There we go. Absolutely. I uh, love talking to that guy. And He's there's crazy. the signature. I think that was when they, um, oh, yeah, the, the Lake Apopka Restoration Act, 1996, just mm -hmm. like what you were saying. Um, there are no farm. There are no uh, working farms up along the edge of the lake anymore. Are there? No, not no. not on the North Shore Restoration Area. There are still sod farms and other um, farms, but on the actual twenty thousand acres, there's uh, there's marsh restoration, lake and the wildlife drive. Yeah, oh, I love that drive. And we can Let's talk see. about that. Yeah, um, this is um, this is one of the systems. You tell me about this. You probably have better wording. This is the Marsh so, Flowway. So basically, the nutshell is 1941. They built a big levee, drained all the water out, left the moist soil, which is called muck, and farmed it for 50 years. And the lake got covered over with algae. We, uh, we managed to purchase those 20,000 acres, stop farming it, <clears throat> and the district uh, is restoring it to a natural wetlands. And there's some core things that they've done over that 20 years that have reduced the phosphorus content is what a lot of biologists and environmental scientists use as a measure of the health of the lake. At its worst, it was 300 parts per billion when the lake was um, pea soup green. Today, it's 80 parts. So in those 20 years, we've reduced it from 300 to 80. And the way that's happened is one, the nutrients don't flow off the North Shore anymore. Two, the district built a 700 plus acre facility up in the upper left-hand corner, right to the left of the Apopka Beauclair Canal, where you see they're called the Marsh Flowway. Mm -hmm. There's four giant cells. The water flows in by gravity, slowly winds its way through vegetation. No chemicals, nothing, just the slow meandering through the, uh, the cells precipitates the phosphorus to the bottom of the cell. Then the water is, clean water is pumped back into the lake and that's why you see that area of clean water uh, there is because they're pumping clean water back into the <clears throat> lake from the marsh flowway. And it recycles the entire volume of the lake about once every 18 months. Wow. Which is um, close to somewhere between 60, 70 billion gallons of water. That's so incredible. That, the, the, the buying the, the farms on North Shore is number one. The Marsh Flowway has been operating since 2003. That's a huge contributor to reducing the phosphorus. Another thing they did is um, when the bass went away because they didn't have the oxygen and the aquatic vegetation, Gizzard Shed took over. That's those shed, guys in the rowboat. Yeah, bottom feeder. And the district gave permits and they take a million pounds of Gizzard Shed out of the lake every year. There's uh, still a lot of fish. Is there a lot reduced, of, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. There's a, there, is there still a lot of shad in the, in the lake? There are. And still. they monitor, the district monitors it. They call themselves the district because St. John's River Water Management District is too hard to say every single sentence. So when mm -hmm. I say the district, that's who I mean. But the district River monitors River. it carefully. And for instance, in Lake Griffin, they got to the point where they didn't need to have, uh, take gizzard shad out. So we'll get to that point someday, but they monitor it very closely. But that's another way that they take out um, phosphorus out of the lake. And aquatic vegetation is another uh, mechanism. The more aquatic vegetation, the healthier the lake. And they have programs where they're increasing the uh, aquatic, submerged aquatic vegetation like eelgrass and emergent like um, spatter dock. So they're, those are the things that they're doing that are the core things that continue year after year after year. You can't pollute a lake for 50 years and get well in 20. So yeah, we've made a lot of progress from 300 to 80. The target is 
55 parts per billion. So we have to keep going and the district continues to do those things. But they don't just do, I call that blocking and tackling, you know, the core things. They yeah. also look at innovative solutions. A company called Phosphorus Free Water Solutions just built a $7 million facility to take phosphorus out of the lake on their own nickel. It's mm. about two miles up the, the uh, uh, Lake Apopka Loop Trail from Magnolia Park. And they're, they've been working on building it uh, at last end of last year, beginning of this year, and are hopefully getting ready to operations. And what happens is they'll measure the phosphorus content of the waters. They take it out of the lake, measure it when they put it back in, and as much phosphorus as they take out, they get paid by the pound. So they wow. call it the paid by the pound. And it's a very innovative business model as well as innovative technology. So that's got a chance to help us get that last bit of phosphorus that we need out. And because the lake is shallow and has a lot of dead vegetation on the bottom of the lake, also called muck, um, dredging is, is an important component. And I guess it was two summers ago or a little a year and a half ago, they dug a, a dredged a big 2000 foot circle up by the Apopka Beauclair Canal with mm -hmm. the idea that if you, it's they call it the dust bunny. Um, you, you know, dust bunnies always collect in the corner and then you take them away and then more collect in the corner. Mm -hmm. This skunk dredging, they created this hole and the hope is that over time, the muck shifts back into that hole and you can keep taking it out. And what they did by doing it up in the Northwest corner, they took all the muck that they dredged, that they got out and pumped it through pipes and found a low lying area of marsh on the North shore and put that muck to raise the marsh level. So it was a win-win, take muck out of the lake, raise uh, the level, the soil level in a low lying part of the marsh. So they're doing the, the same things every year to get better, but they're also trying new things. And um, the result is that we've got a much cleaner lake, which people want to visit now, as you pointed out yeah. earlier. Um, Orange Audubon deserves huge credit for the North Shore Birding Festival mm -hmm. and making the and the district working with the district to make the uh, Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive a birding mecca. Um, Three hundred and seventy species sighted, and um, it's the number one inland bird watching place in the eastern United States. Yeah, so we're so in the Everglades. They're telling me. Exactly. Well, yeah. and, but burgers are coming from all over, not all over the country, all over the world to come here in the winter and in, in uh, December and January, the birding is incredible. So that part of the ecotourism triangle is already established and the reputation's out and it's become yeah. starting to become a haven for cyclists. Orange County is uh, under contract to connect West Orange Trail to Magnolia Park. So that but then when you get around to, uh, across the North Shore to Green Mountain Scenic Byway, Lake ah. is looking at connecting a trail to the Hancock Road Trail. And when that's done, there'll be a 40 mile loop all the way around Lake Apopka where you can ride your bicycle without interacting with cars at all. So cycling is, is it's become a destination and cyclists tend to uh, travel and spend money and collect rides the way birders collect species. Yes. And then, and then we already talked about the fact that there's more canoe or canoeing and kayaking going on out of McDonald um, boat ramp. And the last element is uh, one of the things Full was promoting is we're going to have a fish tag uh, challenge because fishing is back on Lake Apopka. The bass, FWC stocked a million fingerling bass in the lake over the last three years. And for some yeah. reason, largemouth bass love the South Shore of Lake Apopka. Um, professional fishermen are coming through the Apopka Beauclair Canal to get to Apopka to try to catch trophy fish. So the lake's restoration, we're not finished, but the lake's restoration has yielded uh, a regional benefit to us of, of some relatively robust ecotourism. And we're really excited about the future.
Oh yeah, we hear um, from people all the time at the foundation who, uh, you know, we have the map you see on the screen. We hand out that uh, that map on the lower right hand side. They want to bike. They want to hike. Um, they want to see alligators. They want to see um, progress on the lake. They can see the plantings, the horizontal plant. You know, they they lined up. Yeah, they they want. They have such incisive, interesting questions. I mean, the awareness of the restoration of the lake is on so many people's minds that it's just drawing people who wanna see it in progress. You're right. And all those initiatives around the lake, like you see on these maps, walking trails and biking trails and, and, and all kinds of things, it just, it just opens up the lake to a whole new generation of people who really wanna appreciate it for the natural wonder that it is. It's like the battery's getting recharged, a little bit cleaner each year. Um, You've taken those kayak trips with like um, Oakland Nature Preserve, Jim. Yeah, Jim, West is, Jim is Peterson. Yeah. Jim Peterson, the president of Oakland Nature Preserve, with a, a grants from Duke Energy. Thank you, Duke Energy. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, they Duke. Do, they do they do monthly what they call them blue hikes, where Jim, as a biologist, leads a paddling, and they do Lake Apopka. We've gone from uh, Hull Island over to Gordon X Spring. We've gone from Newton Park up to Crown Point. We've gone through McDonald Canal many times. Uh, and he does surrounding areas, um, Lake Louisa. Um, what's the one up with all the, there's, uh, anyway, he, he does one every month. They're amazing if you get a chance to go and they have kayaks and you don't have to own your own kayak. I, I do, but they rent yeah, kayaks. Exactly. And uh, no, that's, what, you're absolutely right. Oakland Nature Preserve is a gem. FOLA's um, mandate is aware, raising awareness. Oakland Nature Preserve's mandate is education and they do it yeah. brilliantly and we work very closely together. So, um, and if you wanna know more about FOLA, we're at FOLA.org, FOLA.org. And we're always looking for people to volunteer yeah. and participate. And um, I, I, like I said, you can't pollute a lake for 15 years sure. well and 20. But we made huge progress and we can't take our foot off the gas. We've got to keep pressing for the, the final complete restoration and supporting of the district and FWC, the Department of Environmental Protection are doing great jobs. So we're, we're really uh, grateful what they do and we try to help as much as we can. Yeah, just, just what you said there, outdoor recreation is an economic engine and leads to a heightened, thoughtful, sustained and sustaining interest in the environment. Those, um, I took last February, I went on a kayak tour with Jim Peterson. I was going to supply history as we made stops from Magnolia Park down to Crown Point. You know, talk about the town's range, just a general thing. But um, turns out I was the least experienced kayaker in the group. I was always last. I'd show up with the rest of the 25 of them huffing and puffing. And then I would have to talk history about the lake. But as I tell people today, you can put your arm in the lake water and actually see your arm below the surface. You couldn't do that 30 years ago. It is amazing. And um, the birds you were talking about, well, I keep doing this wrong. Yeah, um, it's up exactly what you said before. I wanted to show people a picture of these birds. Yeah, uh, like you say, we, you get more species on the North Shore than any other place in the Southeast USA, including the Everglades. Yeah, I love that. Um, when you go, when you take the wild, you've, take, you've taken the wildlife drive, of course, right? Oh, yeah. Anytime anybody yeah. visits, I always take them there. Amazing. And what is it? Still open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And federal holidays. Yeah. And you got to go real slow in your car. And I always tell people later in the day, like afternoon, when the sun is just off the little uh, streams and lakes, and those birds are just roosting and it is incredible. It's a whole different world. I mean, it's fascinating. You'll see alligators on the banks. Maybe if you're lucky, a, a, well, I hate to say a lynx, and everybody sees them that often. What do they call them? Mountain Bob lions, cat. lynx? Uh, bobcats. Bobcats, bobcat. Not mountain lions, Jim. Bobcats. There you go. That's it. Yeah. It is really, really, truly a whole world. It's my um, favorite. The North Shore is my favorite place in Florida to bicycle. <laughs> Because yeah, I've been there in a car on the wildlife drive, but riding your bicycle, you get to see everything. You get to see the bobcat, yeah. river otters, the eagles, the um, 
everything you can imagine is up there. It's just, uh, it's my happy place. It is amazing. I've um, over the since it opened, when we do our educational field trips, we talk about the lake. You know, we have a whole segment on the lake. And I've noticed every year when I ask the 75 kids sitting in front of me, not this year, of course, how many people have been on the North Shore on the wildlife drive? First year? Who knew? Uh, a few years later, practically every hand in that room is up. That, um, and kids love that. Kids love that. It it's gets 120,000 people a year now on that one. Wow. Lake. And I do want to say that the district's done an amazing job and it's very difficult. The reason it's only open, people complain, why is it only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday? Well, they're restoring 20,000 acres of wetland every day. They need Monday through Thursday to do their work. They need access to those roads. And they just announced a... Uh, a donation uh, portal where you can go to St. John's River Water Management District's um, website and actually contribute money to the upkeep because they're doing it out of their budget and they, they frankly, they struggle. So there is a mechanism for us to contribute to the upkeep of the wildlife drive because they will never charge a fee for people to go. And that North Shore Restoration Project is a, a 20,000 acre thing with a relatively small staff that's going to be ongoing for quite a while so yeah. we got a, we got an opportunity to help them yeah those people are dedicated um yeah. i i highly recommend contributions to sjrwmd and definitely uh friends of lake apopka you'll see their um email address right there fola lake at gmail.com and their website is fola.org correct fola.org yes, Yes. And, uh, org. That's it. Make it easy. Right. So people can remember. Yeah. And like, yeah. And like Joe is like Joe said before, their educational arm at the Oakland Nature Preserve, you're educating, you're, you're making the next generations aware. It's not just, we're not just talking to adults about how we clean the lake. It's about getting the next generations interested and invested in something that's so important to this area. And like you say, now more than ever, Lake Apopka is now a thing. You don't laugh at it anymore, you know? It's a thing that really sustains this region. Ah, it's so good well to talk said. to you. Well said, Jim, thank you. I appreciate it. And if um, anyone has any questions about anything, there's uh, you can type in, we'll, we'll see it in chat for the next couple of minutes. Otherwise, um, email either of us, the foundation or FOLA, and um, we'll help you out. We'll help you out with memberships and anything you would like to know. Anything else you would like to add, Joe? I think we're good. I'm uh, just grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for your advocacy and um, just being there. We need more people like you. So thank you so much. Have a great holiday. You too. Have a great holiday. Thanks, Joe.